the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful. Kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. God who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome to all of you in this virtual meeting. And, and so our topic for today is, um, I'm sorry, I gave it in Latin. A race at sacramentum. So I'm going to explain what that means. But basically what we're looking at is something like what we did. So two weeks ago, we looked at sacramental character and we saw that baptism, confirmation, and holy orders imprints an indelible mark on the soul that's different from grace and that persists and abides even if, God forbid, we commit a mortal sin and lose sanctifying grace. Our character remains. And so what we want to ask is, is something like that also the case in the other four sacraments? And that is the Eucharist, and matrimony, and, hi, Kristen, and um, the Eucharist, matrimony, penance, and, whole, and uh, anointing of the sick. Right? And what I'm going to defend is, yes, there's something like uh, baptismal character in those other sacraments, but not exactly like. And that's why we say only three cause an indelible mark, but there's something analogous in the other four sacraments, and there's not a good word in English to refer to this. And so it's traditional for theologians to use this Latin phrase, which I'm going to explain, race et sacramentum, which means for our purposes, reality, that's race, and sign, which is sacrament. We could also call it reality and sacrament. And if you think about it, baptismal character is a reality, right? It's a mark that's really in our souls. So it's a reality, but it's not the final thing. It's not the ultimate purpose of the sacrament, which is to give grace. And so that character is something intermediate. It's not, it's different than the outward sign because the outward side passes away, right? Think of baptism. The priest or, or um, deacon or minister says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that, that part of the sacramental sign is now gone into history, never to come back. But the mark remains for eternity. So it's something abiding, different than the outward sign, but also different from grace, because you can have the character and tragically lose the grace. Right? So that's so it's something like this in the other seconds. I'm going to put my screen on now. And can you see that? Uh, yeah, so race at sacramentum. So it means reality and sign. In the last lecture, we saw baptism, confirmation, holy orders um, imprints this, um, this indelible mark, which we can think of as a kind of intermediate level between the outward sign and the grace given. And we came to this, we, we saw last time that St. Augustine deduced that there was this permanent mark precisely from two facts. First, that you could only be baptized once and you couldn't get rebaptized even if you fell into grave sin or apostasy or heresy or schism. After you came out of the heresy or schism, you didn't get rebaptized. You just go to confession. And so that showed that baptism has an abiding effect distinct from grace. And then secondly, um, when you come out of schism and you go to, um, or, or heresy, and you go to confession, and um, the sanctifying grace returns, and you can see that there still is something there that causes the grace to return, even though the outward sign no longer exists, right? Because something that happened, in my case, um, 30 years ago in the past, um, that has disappeared into past history. But there's something present today 
that can um, cause a sacrament, say baptism, confirmation, or holy orders, to come back to life. And that's that indelible mark, all right? So our question is, what does this look like in the other four sacraments? Is there something in them distinct from the outward sign on the one hand and from the effect of grace on the other? And the theological tradition affirms, yes, there is, although there's some discussion, as we'll see, above all with regard to penance or confession. Well, let's start with the easy one. The easy one is the Eucharist. And so it was with regard to the Eucharist that this theory first got worked out. And it happened in the 12th century. And the reason why it happened in the 12th century, again, this is, might be surprising that um, the theology of the sacraments is worked out 12 centuries after Jesus instituted them. But part of the reason for this is that um, heresies help with the development of doctrine. Um, so when a heretic denies a truth of the faith, that forces theologians to think about it more deeply. And that's what happened in the 11th century. In the 11th century, there was a famous heretic named Berengarius um, who denied the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and more or less. It's a complicated story. It, for our purposes, it just, um, just the kind of the outline is good enough. Um, he, and so what happened with Berengarius is that he thought that the Eucharist um, could be fully understood on the basis of the outward sign, that's the bread and the wine, and the grace given. And so Berengarius acknowledged that the Eucharist nourishes us with grace. But what he denied was that there was anything in between the outward sign and the grace that the Eucharist nourishes us with. And yet the Catholic tradition, based on John 6 and the words of the institution of the Eucharist, this is my body, has always believed that there's, yes, there's a third reality intermediate between the outward sign, the bread and the wine, and the grace of a sharing in Christ's life. And that intermediate thing is Christ's true body and blood. So in this case, um, it was clear that there's an intermediate reality distinct from the outward sign and distinct from the grace given, which has incredible importance. The presence on our altars, and therefore in our bodies after Holy Communion for some 10 minutes, of Jesus Christ's body and blood. In fact, the whole of his humanity, including his human soul, his body, blood, soul, and of course, his divinity, which is also everywhere. Um, and so the theologians who refuted Berengarius's heresy and defended the presence of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist were the first to elaborate a theory in which um, all of the sacraments were spoken of as having these three levels, the outward sign, in the case of the Eucharist, the bread and the wine, and the words of consecration, right? The words of Jesus in the institution narrative, this is my body. And we saw earlier in a previous talk that that's the matter and form of the sacrament, right? The matter being the bread and the wine, and the form being the word spoken by the priest in the consecration, um, being the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, this is my body and this is my blood. Right? In addition to that, the outward sign, and yes, there's the grace given by which we're nourished with the divine life, but in between, there's Christ's body and blood. And so the theologians um, who combated Berengarius and they had to come up with a terminology for these three levels. And that's the origin of um, a key teaching of Catholic theology about the sacraments, that um, there's an outward sign, and an intermediate reality, which we're gonna call reality and sign, and then the reality of grace. And so let's look at the first theologian who maybe used this terminology and clearly expounded this is one of our heroes in this whole lecture series, you of St. Victor. Now he's not a household name, but he's the first theologian to have written a treatise on a systematic theological treatise on the sacraments in general. And so he's a real hero for sacramental theology. He lived at the beginning of the 12th century in the first four decades, 
and he taught in Paris at the school of um, St. Victor, and that's why he's known as um, U of St. Victor. And in his work, he said this, although, speaking about the Eucharist, although the sacrament is one, three distinct things are set forth there. Visible appearance, right, that's the outward sign, the bread and the wine. Truth of body, that's Christ's body and blood, the real presence. And then virtue of spiritual grace. That's the invisible effect that remains with us um, after Jesus's body and blood get digested and no longer are physically present in us, which takes place about 10 minutes after we received Holy Communion. And he says the visible species, which is perceived visibly is one thing, the truth of the body and blood, which under the visible appearance are believed invisibly is another thing. And the spiritual grace, which with body and blood is received invisibly and spiritually is another. And of course, that it's that last thing that is the ultimate fruit. That's why Jesus became man and why he instituted the Eucharist. So as to nourish us progressively with his divine life. But the means that he used to nourish us is precisely his body and blood. U of St. Victor um, was, so sh shortly after U of St. Victor, um, another great theologian, um, who is another hero of our lecture series, is Peter Lombard. And he wrote his um, famous work called The Sentences, um, maybe 20 years after U of St. Victor. And he takes the same idea and gives it the more traditional terminology. So he says, so there are three things. The first, the outward sign, he says, he speaks of it as the sacrament alone. It's just a sign. That's the bread and the wine and the words, right? They're just signs. They're not anything more than signs. I mean, um, so the, the, the bread and the wine would be this, what he calls in Latin the sacramentum tantum, which means sacrament alone. And then he says the second level is both a sacrament and a reality. Um, reality or thing, I, reality would be a better translation. And the third, he says, is a reality and not a sign. So grace is not a sign of anything else. But Christ's body and blood, if you think about it, is both a reality and a sign of something else. It's a sign of the mystical body that we are being made into by receiving his sacramental body. In other words, Jesus into the Eucharist and under the form of bread and wine, which makes his body and blood present, to feed us with his body so as to insert us into his body, his mystical body, and make us living members of his mystical body. And so his sacramental body is the means and in, invisible, magnificent instrument of the enlargement and vivification of his mystical body. And so he uses his sacramental body to propagate on earth and increase um, his mystical body, which is the church, his kingdom. Right? So that's why it's both a sign and a reality. And then the grace is just a reality. It's not a sign of anything else because it's the final thing. And so this then, um, passed from the theologians to the magisterium of the church. And that happens at the beginning of the 13th century when Pope Innocent III takes this terminology in a, um, a dogmatic letter that he writes to another bishop. And he speaks of the same thing. The form is of bread and wine, reality of flesh and blood, and the ultimate effect being the unity and charity in the church. So he says the first is sacrament and not a reality in other words sacrament alone the second sacrament and reality and the third reality and not sacrament um, and we'll see saint thomas aquinas and all the um, all the great theologians of the 13th century embrace this and it becomes part of the patrimony of the church's um, theology and we can see this um, in the scriptures, 
implicitly. So even though, we, obviously, we don't find technical terms in scripture, we get this idea in the bread of life discourse when Jesus says, the bread of life, so John 6, 51, the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so the bread, that's the outward sign. Then he mentions, well, the life of the world, that's the ultimate purpose. That would be the grace that gives life to the world. And the intermediate level is his flesh. And so those three realities are indicated in that one verse of John 6, 51. Bread, flesh, sorry, and the life of the world. And um, St. Thomas put those three levels into the, um, his office that he wrote for the Feast of Corpus Christi that's come down to us in um, the formula of benediction, um, the prayer of benediction. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion. So that would be the, the sign, right? the, the bread and the wine that represent Christ's passion. And we pray so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that's the, the intermediate level, racing sacramentum, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption. And that would be the fruit of grace. And that would be the third level, the race tongue. So here's a little chart. The um, sec sensible sacramental sign, the Latin sacramentum tantum, so in the Eucharist bread and wine. The intermediate level, um, we can so translate literally reality and sign, um, but it's an unusual sign because most signs are visible. This sign is invisible, recognized and seen only by faith. Um, so reality and invisible sign, that's the body and blood, and then the invisible re reality alone, the grace and charity, which build up the unity of the church. Right? So that's um, the classic case of these three levels. All right, so now we've got four sacraments in which we have three levels. So let's go. So last time we spoke about um, character, baptism, confirmation, holy orders, we can see the same three levels the sensible sacramental sign, that's precisely the pouring of water and saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the baptism, or um, for confirmation, the anointing with the chrism and the words of the form um, be, be sealed with the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, or ordination, the laying on of hands and the formula for ordination. Um, so that would be the, the outward sign. And then the hidden reality and sign is the indelible character, which we can't see, but we believe is present in a similar way to the real presence. Right? So just as we can't see Christ's body and blood, unless there's a Eucharistic miracle, but we believe it. So likewise, we believe that there's this indelible mark. And then the invisible reality is the reality of um, justification for baptism um, and the increase of um, grace and charity and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling in confirmation. And likewise, an increase in holy orders um, together with um, a special graces of pastoral charity for the mission of, the, of holy orders. Okay. So that's our four sacraments that give us these three levels. So our question is, what about the other three? Matrimony, penance, and anointing of the sick. So let's look at matrimony first. That's the easiest. So this too is easy because here the outward sign in matrimony is the exchange of vows, right? The I do that each spouse says to the other. And we saw that that's both the matter and the form of the sacrament. And in saying it, each spouse is minister to the other. That's a beautiful thing about matrimony. The spouses are the, the proper ministers and the priest is the and canonical witness. So that exchange of vows is the sensible um, outward sign, the sacramentum tantum. The race tantum, the grace, will be an increase of grace and charity, and precisely those graces that sanctify the couple in their mission of um, holy matrimony. Right? And that's all, I mean, so many graces that we need to be good um, husbands, wives, and mothers and fathers, to be icons of Christ and the church. 
is there an intermediate reality? Here it's easy, right? The intermediate reality is the matrimonial bond, right? Because the words themselves, I do, they fall into the past immediately. But the reality of being, of there being a matrimonial covenant or bond remains throughout the life of the matrimony. And in fact, it's indissoluble. It's a naturally indissoluble bond. An annulment doesn't annul it. It simply says it never existed. There's no power on earth that can dissolve a sacramental matrimonial bond. So in that sense, it's like character being indestructible, but there's this difference that um, it comes to an end when one of the spouses dies. And thus, if one spouse remains alive and the other dies, the first spouse can um, remarry. And so it's different than, than baptism, confirmation, holy orders, because it can be repeated after the death of the spouse, right? But you can see it's very close to um, character, the bond. And so um, that, that's precisely going to be our intermediate reality. And um, the magisterium has um, taught this. Um, and what in fact, how should we think of this intermediate reality? The Second Vatican Council um, in Gaudium et Spes, its section on matrimony, um, has a beautiful treatment of Christian matrimony and speaks of um, a consecration. So Christian spouses, it says, have a special sacrament, matrimony, by which they are fortified and receive a kind of consecration in the duties and dignity of their state. And what I'm suggesting is that that is precisely the race at sacramentum, the reality and sign of this sacrament, a permanent um, consecration of um, this spiritual bond between husband and wife, a mutual self-gift of one to the other, which is elevated and consecrated by the sacrament. Right? So even in a natural, so let's take two unbaptized people. So my wife and I, Marcia, were married as unbaptized persons. And so we had a natural matrimony in which there was an, a matrimonial bond created by our mutual I do, right? So our exchange of vows established a natural matrimony. At the moment we were, we were baptized together with our baby, and at that moment when we were both baptized, that matrimony was elevated um, and consecrated by being inserted into Christ. And so that would be the race at sacramentum of the sacrament that elevation and consecration of the matrimonial bond. Paul VI um, spoke about this shortly after the council in Humanae Vitae, and says by this sacrament, matrimony, the spouses are strengthened, and one might almost say consecrated to the faithful fulfillment of their duties. Thus they will realize to the full their calling and bear witness as becomes them to Christ before the world. For the Lord has entrusted them with the task. And so this is the mission. So um, we should think of their um, matrimonial bond as a consecration of that um, mutual self-gift of the spouses and a new ecclesial mission. And the new ecclesial mission is to make visible to other people the holiness and joy of Christian matrimony, which images Christ and the church. And John Paul II, in his great document on marriage and the family, Palmyaris Consortio, at the beginning of his pontificate, he speaks um, more technically. And he says that um, the race at sacramentum is precisely, so he says, the spouses participate in the sacrament as spouses, so that the first and immediate effect of marriage, the race at sacramentum, is not supernatural grace itself, but the Christian conjugal bond. And so that's the race at sacramentum. A typically Christian communion of two persons because it represents the mystery of Christ's incarnation and the mystery of his covenant with his people, right? the, the new and eternal covenant. And the content is conjugal love, right? So the, that's, the, that's what's getting elevated a deeply personal unity, a mutual 
self-gift, open to fertility. And he says it's the normal characteristics of all natural conjugal love, but with a new significance, a new significance because it's been inserted by baptism into Christ, which makes the spouses the expression of specifically Christian values, precisely the love by which Christ gives himself for his bride, the church. And the fidelity with the church serves her Lord. All right. So that's matrimony. Um, so let's go on to the, so we've got now five sacraments in which we can identify an intermediate reality formed by the sacrament. So the way we should think of this is the outward sign causes this intermediate reality. So let's say, again, the Eucharist is the easiest case. The outward sign being the bread and the wine and the words of the priest, which are the words of Christ, this is my body. Those words make it happen. They, they create, as it were, the reality. They work the transubstantiation by which now Christ becomes present in his body and blood. So the outward sign causes the intermediate reality of Christ's body and blood. And then his body and blood causes the grace that grows in us as we receive Holy Communion. All right, so there's a double causality. I'm gonna talk more about this in a future talk. And so we'll come back to this idea. And so the idea is also in matrimony, the outward words, I do, create this inward bond the matrimonial bond, um, which is an, an image of Christ in the church. And, and then that bond unleashes graces throughout the life of the matrimony. So even though we were married um, many years in the past, today that matrimonial bond is unleashing graces to continue to be a good spouse, father, um, husband, etc. All right. So let's look now at the remaining two sacraments, um, anointing of the sick and uh, penance. And we'll see it's a little harder in both of these cases to identify the intermediate level. So, so anointing of the sick. So here, St. Thomas um, Aquinas um, is, to my knowledge, is among the first who identifies this intermediate reality. And he says it's an interior anointing. So there's an exterior anointing, that's the, the outward form of the sacrament, that the, the matter being the olive oil, which the priest applies on the head and the hands, and saying the words of the form, that would be the outward sign. And so St. Thomas speaks of an interior anointing that remains as the intermediate level. And then the, the third, the res tantum, is the grace of, um, of the sacrament to strengthen the sick person with hope, with charity, with, um, with confidence in God's mercy, et cetera. Unleashing the redemptive power of suffering. Right? So that we can see um, the outward sign, the oil, the um, effect of spiritual strengthening, but an interior, why do we think here there's an interior reality? And the, the, the principal reason is because in any illness um, or any stage of an illness, you can only be anointed once. And so that leads, makes it reasonable to think that that anointing abides. Now, the outward anointing doesn't abide, right? I take a shower and it's gone. Um, but the inward anointing has to remain throughout the period of the illness in order for it to cause the graces throughout the illness. And so that's why St. Thomas speaks of an interior anointing. And he says it's like an interior devotion which remains in the person, imprinted by the exterior anointing. And I think something that can be helpful is to think of it as a consecration. So we saw um, the magisterium of the church in um, Second Vatican Council spoke of matrimony as a kind of the sacrament, as a consecration of the spouses. So I think we can think in a similar way here, especially because Oil is used precisely to consecrate, right? If you've ever been to a consecration of an altar or a church, it's very impressive because the bishop pours out oil, right, chrism, onto the altar and anoints it like it as if it were anointing of the sick or confirmation. 
and and so um, consecration is typically done with consecrated oil to claim something as reserved for God. And so it seems to make sense that um, anointing of the sick is a kind of consecration of this illness. Consecration for what? To unleash its redemptive power. Jesus, in dying for us, in suffering his passion, he um, manifested, but not only manifested, he in some sense infused, he gave by assuming suffering into his own person, he gave to suffering a power, a redemptive power. In other words, by using suffering to redeem the world, he gave to all human suffering a power to have them to participate in the redemption of the world by offering that suffering for um, grace. Um, and, and we can think of the sacrament of anointing of the sick as giving to the sick person um, an unleashing, as it were, of the power of redemptive suffering so that it can now share in the power of Christ's own redemptive suffering. Now, so it, it's like character, we should think, but it's different in that um, it doesn't abide indelibly, right? And thanks be to God, because we wouldn't want to be sick indefinite, indefinitely. And so, and the hope of a sick person who gets anointed is that we'll recover. And sometimes the sacrament has that effect of curing the sick person, but only when that is advantageous for the sick person. So it, it, um, illness gives a, um, the sick person a special mission in the body of the church, but not a permanent mission in the way that baptism, confirmation, and holy orders does. And so those three sacraments that give character give a new permanent mission in the church. Baptism to be a member of the church permanently. Confirmation to be an active witness of Christ before the world and holy orders to act in the person of the head. And anointing the sick doesn't give a permanent mission, but it gives a mission for as long as we're ill. Um, but even before that, we can think it gives a configuration to Christ. And that's what we said, it configures the sick person to Christ himself who um, took on um, infirmity in his passion to the supreme degree. And so it's a configuring to Christ's passion. It's a, sorry, a sharing in his ecclesial mission. And therefore we should think it gives a power. And this is part of the paradox of the Christian life. The paradox that St. Paul speaks about, that when I'm weak, in, then I'm strong in the Lord. It's precisely in our weakness, humanly seen, that we're actually strongest because we're most configured to Christ's own suffering and weakness. Um, and so it's fitting that this sacrament give up spiritual power precisely to that weakness of infirmity to make the weakness of infirmity stronger than health, right? in terms of spiritual power. Right? So, and these three elements, um, configuration of Christ, mission, and spiritual power, are what we looked at two weeks ago when we looked at character. We saw that sacramental character gives these three things. So when we're baptized, we're stamped with Christ's image. That's how we should think of baptismal character. Those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, stamp as it were the image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on our soul so that we're claimed for Christ and for the Trinity. Right? So confirmation and baptism and then confirmation increases that, right? stamping us further with Christ to make us his witness in the power of the Spirit, um, witness to the Father before the world, um, and holy orders even more so. Again, giving um, the person who receives it a new stamp of Christ so that he can act in the person of Christ and engender new um, children to Holy Mother Church as a father, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So 
character always gives a new configuration to Christ and to the Trinity. And so what we're saying here is that anointing the sick does something analogous and similar. It gives us a new configuration to Christ. Now Christ precisely in his suffering and weakness by which he redeemed the world. And then we saw that um, baptism, confirmation, holy orders give a new mission, right? Baptism giving the mission to be a member of the church, to die to self and to live to Christ. Confirmation to be an active witness um, and build up the church and holy orders to build it up in the person of Christ, the head and the bridegroom. And so what I'm suggesting is anointing of the sick likewise gives a new mission. And that is to make use of the illness that the person didn't choose, but received to make use of it for redemption by offering that illness for the salvation of others and for themselves, right? For their own spiritual purification. So that's the new ecclesial mission. And then the spiritual power is the special graces that come to a person precisely in the time of illness. And if you think about it, um, many conversion stories happen through illness. Right? God makes use of illness to unleash spiritual power, um, not at all infrequently. Right? So many saints, um, St. Francis of Assisi had a terrible illness at the beginning of his conversion, and St. Um, Ignatius of Loyola and tons of others, St. Uh, Teresa of Avila, um, reading the lives of the saints, very often God makes use of some very powerful illness to be a catalyst in their sanctity and conversion. And so it's reasonably think that he does that on a much wider scale. And that's precisely the purpose of this sacrament. And this is also, I think, why um, this sacrament isn't frequently, we only need to receive it once during a given illness because that illness is now consecrated, right? So um, once we've been anointed in a given illness, um, we're sufficiently anointed because that interior anointing will continue throughout the illness. Now it's true if it significantly worsens, one can be anointed again because that's like a new illness, one in which it's entered a, a different phase as it were. So here I'm just in this slide, just spelling out what is this mission? So we said to make use of suffering and for what purposes? For um, an increase of their own merit, right? So that's the first thing. Suffering is meritorious when we do it in love, right? That when we um, have resignation and even better, if we can um, willingly um, accept it and sometimes even thank God for it, recognizing that he's working good through it. I had an interesting experience speaking about this with my atheist father. So it was shortly before he died. Um, so he was a lifelong atheist. But um, we were talking about redemptive suffering. And um, he said, you know, I've got an example of that from my own life. When he was, when my dad was a year and a half old, he got polio. And as a result of it, he was crippled. His, um, he lost his muscles in one of his legs. And so he could never do sports. And, and he said, you know, um, that was actually a great grace in my life. Because since I couldn't do sports, I turned to more intellectual things. And, um, and so he became a scientist and culture. And so that it was really beautiful to me to see how an atheist can recognize the power of, of suffering and illness in our life for unleashing of good, right? for graces, although he didn't use that word. Um, so it gives um, a growth in the spiritual life very frequently. Um, it satisfies our um, debt of um, temporal punishment for sin. So when we sin, um, repentance takes away the sin, but we've still left harm in the world by our sins. And so that's why we want to continue to do penance for our past sins. Well, an illness is one of the best ways to do penance for our past sins, simply by offering this illness that we didn't choose. And right? it's a better offering than something that I do choose, like fasting or uh, um, precisely because it's given by God. Um, and then it also purifies us from worldly attitudes, right? worldly desires, because when we're sick, we tend not to, to desire those worldly things so much. Um, and it's a great way of offering something for others, 
Um, and so we, I think this is a great mission in the church to make known the power of redemptive suffering. Um, a little parenthesis here. One of the best documents on this, one of my favorites, is by John Paul II, Salvifici Dolores, on the, the redemptive power of suffering. And in this document, he speaks of a veneration. He says that in faith, we venerate suffering, not because suffering in itself is good, no, but because Christ made it an instrument of redemption. And so we can, the church can get on her knees, as it were, before the suffering, not only of Christ, but of all the members of his body and all the potential members of his body as well. That is, of every human being. So that is a quote from the catechism. The catechism speaks of um, anointing of the sick in um, number 1521. And it says, by the grace of this sacrament, the sick person receives the strength and the gift of uniting himself more closely to Christ's passion. In a certain way, he is consecrated to bear fruit by configuration to the Savior's redemptive passion. Suffering a consequence of original sin acquires a new meaning it becomes a participation in the saving work of Jesus. It's a magnificent paragraph, I think. It encapsulates everything we've been, I've been trying to say about um, the, um, you could say the racist sacramentum of anointing of the sick. So it gives a new configuration to Christ and a new mission and the power to do that mission um, throughout the time of the illness. Okay, let's go on to the last sacrament that we're gonna look at, and that's penance. And this is the hardest to identify um, an intermediate level. Um, and the, so this is gonna be difficult, sorry. So let me, uh, disclaimer, um, this discussion has been difficult for theologians throughout the centuries. And so it won't be easy for me to do this in 15 minutes, but we'll try. Why is this difficult? Because in the other sacraments, we could, uh, um, it was possible, let's take baptism. Well, maybe the Eucharist being the easiest. In the Eucharist, it was clear that there's something that abides um, after the outward sign goes away, but is distinct from grace, and that's Christ's body and blood. And we saw in baptism, confirmation, the holy orders, yes, something abides, that's the indelible mark, even if a person loses the state of grace or gets baptized not in a state of grace, right? So if somebody gets baptized without repentance, with a habit of mortal sin, planning to continue to mortally sin, then baptism, if he intends to be baptized, will be valid, but unfruitful. Right? And so that's how we can see there's something distinct from grace, and that is the character that gets imprinted in that case, even without the grace. That can't happen in the sacrament of penance. And that's because if a person goes to confession without repentance, it's not unfruitful only, it's also invalid. And that's because um, the sacramental sign of penance includes contrition. Contrition is a predisposition that we have to bring to the confessional. If I don't bring it to the confessional, what I say in the confessional will is invalidly said. In other words, I won't be validly absolved, even though the priest says, says those words, if I'm hiding back a sin that I'm not repenting. So penance is the one sacrament that can't um, be received validly and unfruitfully. And it can't come back to life afterwards. Suppose I go to confession insincerely. It's invalid. And it's, even though afterwards I repent, that previous confession is not going to come back to life. I have to have a new confession that's valid. Right, so this is why it's harder in this case to identify something that remains distinct from grace. Because in this particular sacrament, either it's valid and grace is given, or it's invalid and no grace is given. But surprisingly, this was actually the sacrament in which the medieval theologians first identified an intermediate thing after the Eucharist. In other words, it was the second sacrament in which the medieval theologians identified this intermediate level. Yeah. And that's Peter Lombard. So Peter Lombard, another one of his great 
merits in theology is that he was the first to identify an intermediate level in the sacrament of penance, um, which he, so he says this, as in the sacrament of the body, that is the Eucharist, um, so also in this sacrament, the sacrament alone is one thing, the outward sign, that's outward penance, that would be our confession, our um, act of contrition, and our being willing to do the satisfaction, our ten Hail Marys or whatever it is, um, and the words of absolution. That's outward penance. But he says another thing is reality and sign, and that's inward penance. That's the penance in my heart, by which in my heart I repent of sin. And then finally, there's the, the third ultimate fruit of the sacrament, and that's the forgiveness of sins and justification, the restoration of sanctifying grace. Right? So he's identifying the intermediate thing as inward penance. And he says that the outward penance is a sign of the inward penance and of the remission of sins. And so the outward sign is a sign of both of the other effects. And St. Thomas Aquinas follows Peter Lombard on this point. And so he too speaks of um, an inward repentance as the race at sacramentum of this sacrament. It's a reality, right? It's an invisible reality. It's in my heart. No one else can see it except God. But it's a reality, right? It's not, um, but it's not the ultimate reality because the ultimate reality is God infusing grace into my heart, which is different than the repentance, right? The repentance is a sorrow that I have about my sin, and the grace is God's sanctifying grace being restored to me. And so my interior repentance is signified by the outward words, but is itself an instrument in God restoring grace. Right? So that would be the chain of the three things. I say the outward words, those outward words um, can, well, those outward words are signifying my interior repentance, and that interior repentance is um, bringing about the restoration of God's grace to me. Right? That's the idea. So we could make a chart of it. The, the sacramental sign is the outward contrition. In other words, what I say when I say my act of contrition, right? The priest asks, make your act of contrition. And then the confession and the work of satisfaction. That's the outward sign. The ultimate reality of grace is the forgiveness of sins, restoration of grace and charity, and then a series of graces to help us combat the sins we've confessed. Right? So suppose I confess I don't know, impatience. I will get over the course of time um, actual grace from God to be more patient and humble, etc. So what's the intermediate? St. Thomas thinks interior penance. But there are some difficulties with this. And maybe you've already thought of those difficulties. The first and most obvious difficulty is I need to have that interior repentance before and Because I just said earlier, if I go to confession without it, my confession is invalid. So it seems that that inward penance isn't the fruit of the outward penance, but the other way around. It's a precondition for my going to to make my confession validly. Right, so that's the principal problem here. How can it be, because um, think of it, if it's something like sacramental character, the sacramental character is the fruit, the effect of the outward sacrament, right? Sacramental character didn't exist. And only once a person is baptized, the baptism itself creates that character. Whereas here, it seems that it's the other way around. I have to have that interior repentance before I go to confession. And how do I get it? I get it by actual grace given to me to repent beforehand. So it doesn't seem to be the product of the sacrament. That's the difficulty. Now, most Thomists continue to hold St. Thomas's position, but they have to grapple with that difficulty and it's hard to give a good account of it. And so as a result, other theologians have suggested an alternative solution, um, and that is reconciliation with the church. So here would be the idea. The, um, maybe the easiest way to think of this is to think of how the early church did this sacrament. So in the early church, um, this sacrament was not received very often, understatement. It could only be received once in a lifetime, and it was only received 
for the most um, terrible sins, um, murder, idolatry, and adultery, basically. Um, and when a person had committed those sins, he would confess to the, the bishop or his designated um, priest, and, and then would enter a stage called public penance, in which you would be a public penitent, and you couldn't go to communion. You would be excluded from the church during the Eucharistic prayer. And right? so before the Eucharistic prayer, the deacon would say, holy things for holy people, and everyone who was a catechumen or a penitent had to leave. And some, in some places, you couldn't even enter the church if you were in the order of penitence. But then on Holy Thursday, um, after you had done penance for some considerable amount of time, in some cases years, you would be solemnly readmitted into communion on the, um, in the liturgy of Holy Thursday. And then you would be able to receive communion on the Easter Vigil. And so it, that was a very dramatic reconciliation with the church that took place in that Holy Thursday ceremony. So some theologians have thought, ah, the intermediate reality is precisely reconciliation with the church that then would unleash God's reconciliation. And that would be the forgiveness of sins and the reconciliation with God. And so the idea being by the church um, solemnly reconciling sinners on the um, Holy Thursday ceremony, um, it would then um, make possible reconciliation with God and then the forgiveness of sins. And so a lot of theologians, so this is, I, I would say today, most theologians favor this solution. And many famous theologians, Karl Rahner and, and, and many others. And, but it too has problems. And, and it works well with the way that the early church understood the sacrament, but it doesn't work so well for the way that we experience the sacrament. And for several reasons. First of all, because we're not, there's no public reconciliation with the church that takes place today in the sacrament of penance, right? It's, it's a private thing. Thanks be to God, there's no public. Um, I think this is a, a beautiful example of development of doctrine in the way that the sacraments are practiced in the life of the church. The fact that the church stopped doing the public penance of the early centuries, in which there was this dramatic reconciliation with the church. So now you just simply, you go to confession and there isn't a dramatic reconciliation with the church. What The way we tend to understand it is immediately a reconciliation with God. And because of that reconciliation with God, a strengthening, a return of graces that enables me to help repair the, um, um, the unity of the church that my sin had strained. So, it's, so here's the question, what is the order? What comes first? Reconciliation with God or reconciliation with the church? And furthermore, um, most sac so it, if every, it's possible that um, I commit a sin that's also excommunicable. Right? So for an example would be abortion. If I knew that abortion caused, had the penalty of excommunication, um, that would excommunicate me. And so in that case, in addition to forgiveness of sins, I need to be reconciled with the church. But very few sins are of that nature that they cause excommunication. And then furthermore, we go to confession very often, hopefully, and just for venial sins, which don't cause any um, lack of um, unity with the church. And so it's hard to understand how in a confession, just of venial sins, there's any reconciliation with the church. And so I think this solution is incorrect, personally. Um, because again, the principal reason, it seems that reconciliation with God is something primary. That happens, that's the first effect of the sacrament that then helps me to heal other rifts in the church that my sin has caused. Right? So a good confession will first reconcile me with God and then with my spouse, my children, with um, the larger community, etc. So I, I'm going to try and make a third alternative, which in reality is going back to St. Thomas's solution and tweaking it a little bit. And so what I'd like to propose is that um, the in intermediate reality in the sacrament of penance, yes, is interior repentance, as St. Thomas spoke of, but sacramentally configured 
to Christ's own satisfaction for sin. In other words, yes, before I went to confession, I had to already repent, say when I did my examination of conscience. But then when I bring that to confession and make my confession and I hear the words of absolution, that interior reality, we could say, is now gotten stamped. It's gotten stamped with Christ's forgiveness and my own expression before the world, that is before the priest, of my own sinfulness. In other words, that interior repentance got externalized and got um, met um, with Christ's absolution. And so that we could say that my interior repentance has now been sacramentally imprinted with Christ, with Christ's own satisfaction for sin. So what do I mean by that? Christ, one of the reasons why God became man, by the word became incarnate, was so that he could do penance for sin. Not his own sin, right? But the sin of his body and the sin of the world. And so Christ did penance in his passion for all the sins of the world. And so what we're doing when we go to confession is we're entering into, as it were, we're identifying our own um, grief over our sin with Christ's. And that's, um, um, our interior repentance is, what should we say, um, sacramentally changed by presenting it in the tribunal of confession. And this is why it's useful to go to confession rather than just, um, yeah. yes, we can confess in our God corner. And that's the first thing we ought to do when we're aware that we've offended God, right? Is immediately in prayer to tell God we're sorry. But when we go to confession, we're presenting it, as it were, externally before Christ. We're telling it to Christ, and he's responding to it with his words of absolution. And so we can think of that as um, elevating our interior repentance and giving it a stamp of Christ. And then the final effect is, yes, the forgiveness of sins. Right? The forgiveness of those sins that I am repentant for and Christ has absolved me of. The Council of Trent gives some support to this because the Council of Trent says um, that in the sacrament of penance, we conform ourselves to Christ Jesus, who made satisfaction for our sins. Right? So Christ, his passion was precisely um, a making satisfaction for my sin and yours. And when we go to confession, we're as it were, we're configuring ourselves to Christ's own sorrow over sin, saying, I too am sorry. We're joining our sin. In other words, this, and this is what I, Protestants don't understand, I think, about this sacrament. Protestants tend to think, well, he did it. He, he did penance. What do I have to do? But the whole, so this is a much bigger question. Christ did this out of solidarity, right? He, he came, he did satisfaction for our sins, but not so that we would simply be off the hook, but so that we could enter into his sorrow over sin, also being sorry for our own sins. Yes, obviously not as perfectly as he is sorry for my sins, but somewhat. Um, in other words, we're, we're being configured to his penance. Right? So we could think of it as interior penance, sacramentally configured, to the penance of Christ. And I think this is a really beautiful idea simply because um, it shows us again that Christ in everything that he did, he did for us not to replace us, not to substitute for us, but so as to bring us into participation with him. And so just as he suffered for us when we looked at anointing of the sick so that we could share in the power of redemptive suffering, so too he's done satisfaction for sin and sorrowed over sin, above all in Gethsemane and on the cross, so that we could join in his sorrow over our sin and do penance for it. Yes, on an infinitely lesser level than he did, but with a real sharing. And that gives a new mission, right? And that mission is to do penance for sin. Christ's whole life, was a doing penance, but especially his passion. And so we too can share in that mission. And what's the fruit? Reconciliation. 
double reconciliation, vertical and horizontal, right? The vertical reconciliation with God and the horizontal reconciliation in the world and in the church and in the family. And so we could think again of the three things. Um, I, so a new identity in Christ as a penitent, a new mission of reconciliation, and a new power, a spiritual power to bring forth fruits of repentance. And so this is, we should think frequent confession is a great gift because every new confession will strengthen that power to bring forth fruits of repentance. And that is to reconcile, to reconcile, first of all, myself, but also to bring about reconciliation in all of the different societies in which we belong, our own family, um, our friends, our parish, our church, mankind as a whole, right? The local community itself. And thus to combat sin with Christ, soaring over it and making satisfaction for it. So when we see our neighbor sinning, I can do and um, offer up sacrifices for that neighbor as well as for myself. In other words, to take it not only um, for our own sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. How long will this remain? It seems reasonable to think that this intermediate level, this um, new configuration with Christ will remain as long as we stay in a state of grace. If I fall into a new mortal sin, I've lost that intermediate level and I'll need to go back to confession. Now, it can, it's a very good idea to um, go frequently even when there is no mortal sin, right? Because we'll be continually strengthened in interior repentance. But it seems that that um, interior repentance configured to Christ will remain until a mortal sin does it away. The church hasn't defined this. This is theological speculation, um, but it seems reasonable to hold that. And so, in summary, there's both a, um, a Christological and an ecclesial dimension to penance. The Christological dimension is first, and I think that's true in this intermediate level in all the sacraments. We get configured to Christ through the sacraments. And in this particular case, penance configuring us to Christ's own sorrow over sin. But that immediately gives an ecclesial dimension because Christ sorrowed over the sin of his body, his church. And so when we go to confession, we're also committing ourselves to reconciliation in the body of the church. Okay. All right, so let's draw a little summary now and draw some conclusions. So the sacraments um, are a complex reality. The outward sign is here just for a minute. Right? The outward sign, especially the words, are said and they disappear into past history. But they're the grace hopefully abides, but we know it can be lost by mortal sin. But this intermediate level is more abiding, and that's a, a blessing, right? It, it's more abiding because it can remain even if the grace tragically is lost or never was um, allowed to appear in the first place. And so we could say that the sacraments have different levels of durability, and this intermediate level is generally the most durable except in the Eucharist. Um, and so in each sacrament, it's this, the intermediate level has a different durability. So the most durable is sacramental character. That's indelible and eternal. So baptism, confirmation, and holy orders imprint a character that is a character of Christ. And just as Christ is eternal, this character is likewise eternal and will never be lost. The next most durable is matrimony because it's um, a covenant mirroring Christ's own covenant. So it's indissoluble. But death, and that's exactly what we say in the marriage vows, till death do us part. But death can do us part. And so matrimony isn't as um, lasting or abiding as character. It lasts until death. Um, the Eucharist is less lasting still. Right? It lasts as long as the um, bread and the wine are not corrupted. Right? So as long as the bread and the wine remain, Christ's body and blood remain. But as soon as they get corrupted, say by our stomachs, 
and he ceases to be there in his body and blood. So that would be the, the least abiding. And then um, in between would be anointing of the sick. That lasts as long as the illness lasts. And then penance, we said, it's reasonable to think it lasts as long as we remain in a state of grace. Um, the interior grace, yes, is given so that it would last forever, but um, it can be chased away by mortal sin. In addition to it, every sacrament gives actual graces, and it's the nature of actual grace to be transient. It's a grace that we receive at a given time for a particular purpose. Now, another thing about the three levels is that um, the first two levels are, are objective. So the outward sign is something objective. It's either you either have the outward sign or you don't. The character is objective. Either a person, it's invisible, but it's subjective. And likewise, Christ's body and blood, it's invisible, but it's objective. It's not subjective, right? It's not in my mind. It's there on the altar, just that nobody can see it. It's an objective presence, and it's always the same. Right? Sacramental character is always imprinted the same, and Christ's body and blood in every Mass is always the same. Right? There's not different bodies of Christ, there's only one body. And so every Eucharist makes present the same body and blood. But the third level, the race tantum, the reality of grace, that's different in every person and in every time we receive a sacrament because it's received according to our dispositions. And again, that's a really important um, truth because that shows the importance, the incredible importance of being well disposed interiorly. The, and that disposition is above all desire. The more we desire Christ's grace, the more we're gonna receive his grace in the sacraments. Right? And so we can say it's subjective. I mean, it's objective in that it's real. It's subjective in that it depends on our dispositions. And similarly in matrimony, the matrimonial bond is always gonna be the same, it's going to be real, objective, but the graces to live out matrimony, that will depend on our disposition, our desire for them. Okay. And then one last point. And with regard to the sacraments, we speak about three different things. Licitness, validity, and fruitfulness. Let me just say something about that. A sacrament is licit when it's in accordance with canon law and with the rubrics. And so that concerns the outward sign. Validity means that the essence of the sacrament is there, and therefore the race at sacramentum, the intermediate level, gets imprinted. So let's take the Eucharist. It's, we say the Eucharist is valid when Christ's body and blood is produced. Baptism is valid when the character of baptism gets imprinted. Um, holy orders is valid when the character of holy orders gets imprinted, and likewise confirmation. All right, so we could say validity means that the race at sacramentum gets produced. And then fruitfulness concerns the third level of grace. We say a sacrament is fruitful when it produces that grace and in abundance. Right, the, and only one sacrament penance and validity and fruitfulness will always go together. But again, um, a sacrament penance can be valid and less fruitful or more fruitful. And the more or less fruitful, will have to do with our desire for um, penance. Right? And that means our sorrow over sin and our desire to make up for it. So here's a, a final summary of all the seven sacraments. So the outward sign, that's the easy part. Immersion in water in case of baptism, anointing with chrism, bread and wine in the Eucharist. Um, our penance is a little more complicated. It's three things, contrition, confession, and our act of satisfaction, say our three Hail Marys. Anointing the sick, anointing with oil, laying on of hands and holy orders, exchange of vows and matrimony. That's the easy part, the outward sign. And then in all the seven sacraments, we've got this intermediate thing, baptismal character, character of confirmation, Christ's body and blood, configuration with the penance of Christ. That's what I'm claiming in penance. Configuration with the suffering of Christ, anointing the sick, episcopal character, priestly character, diaconal character and holy orders, and the matrimonial bond. And then in all the sacraments, there's grace given, right? Grace and charity, either initially baptism or a strengthening, a strengthening in confirmation, and a strengthening and feeding, nourishing in, in communion, forgiveness of sins, 
and then grace for particular purposes in the other sacraments, matrimony and holy orders. All right, so that's kind of our summary of the three levels of the second. So, let's, so I'm gonna close here and um, take a short break and we'll do questions. Sorry, that was a lot of information packed into a short time. So write your question on the chat um, feature if you want. Um, and we'll start with those. Question from Jason. Um, what did Berengarius hope to gain by denying the intermediate level? Um, good question. I don't know that he, um, I think the best way to understand it is that heresies generally arise um, with regard to um, what is above us. In other words, what is most supernatural and therefore above natural power. And so in the Eucharist, Christ, I mean, the real presence is um, a stumbling block for many, precisely because um, of transubstantiation is above all natural power, right? So to take one substance, bread and, and wine, and to make it into another substance, Christ's body and blood, no created power can do that. And then there's another, that, that happens in a second. And then above all, it happens in a way in which there's no empirical verification so that we continue to see the same bread and the wine and then we eat it and it tastes the same. And if I eat enough of it, I get full. And if I drink enough of the consecrated wine, I get drunk. It seemed, and that we take it to any chemical lab and there's no difference. Um, and so part of the reason, going back to our first uh, talk, we spoke about the fittingness of the sacraments. And we said one of the reasons of fittingness is that they nourish faith. They nourish faith, though, by being difficult for faith. Right? In other words, they nourish faith by giving faith an opportunity to affirm itself, to affirm Christ's word, even though we see all the opposite of Christ's word. Right? So Christ's word, this is my body. And what do I see? Bread. Wine. What does it taste like? Bread. What is it? touch like, what does it do in my stomach, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, yes, of course, this is going to be a stumbling block for heretics and um, the real presence. And it continues to be for good Catholics too, right? Our, I mean, so I think Berengarius' motive was no different than that of your, your Catholic parishioner who has trouble with the real presence. It's just that Berengarius was a theologian and he tried to give a theological explanation that, um, yeah, in some way um, glossed over the difficulty of believing in Christ's body and blood. Yeah. And that's this, one of the surfaces I think that heresy does in every time. It makes it necessary to, for faith to respond and to reinforce that. So what, what's interesting was that oftentimes theologians, um, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, what happened in the 11th century is something similar today, right? So in our day, it can happen that theologians can undermine mysteries, but the common faithful, um, they believe it because they were taught that, you know, by grandma. And, and the same thing happened in the, 12, in the 11th century, that the simple faithful believed in the real presence because of catechesis, because of the Catholic knows, and that is part of the gift of confirmation. And that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and um, and had a better faith than learned theologians like Berengarius. So yeah, that that would be the I think what motivates someone like Berengarius. Um, but the glory of someone like Aquinas is that what you want to do in theology is to retain the simple faith of the child while seeking to understand it without in any way losing that simple faith of the child. And that means recognizing that all my explanation is um, is straw, right, compared to, as, as St. Thomas said at the end of his life. Okay, um, a question here from Bob. Um, in the case of matrimony in a natural marriage, not between two Christians, is there still an intermediate level of some sort? If so, does it cause any graces, presumably actual? And related question, in a sacramental marriage entered into immortal sin, is the intermediate form still caused? If so, is the grace not caused by the intermediate form until both spouses return to the state of grace? 
great question. I'm gonna start with the second half and then go back to the first. So for the second half, let's take a sacramental marriage entered into immortal sin. Yes, so that's very important. Um, if you have two spouses, tragically in a state, one or the other in a state of mortal sin or both, um, or um, let's suppose that mortal sin is um, a lack of faith, a culpable disbelief in the religion in which they were baptized in or, or something else. Um, yes, as long as they're giving proper matrimonial consent, the matrimony is valid. And so that, there's a, an axiom that we say in theology, consent makes matrimony. And so as long as the consent is valid and the canonical form is there, um, the lack of repentance won't block the truth of the marriage. Right? So the, the, and thanks be to God. Because otherwise, you'd never know whether a marriage was valid or not. Because if it depended on the interior disposition of the, um, the person being in a state of grace or not, that's something that ultimately is known only to God. So it can't be dependent on that. And it's the same thing too about um, the minister um, for all the other sacraments. It doesn't matter if he's in a state of grace or not. And likewise in matrimony, because the spouses are the ministers. All right, so it's, it would be a valid marriage. But is, and therefore, is the intermediate level formed? Yes. So they will have the sacramental matrimonial bond. But that intermediate level is meant to be the source of the graces that the couple needs to sanctify their marriage. And that will be blocked as long as they remain in unrepentance. Right? And so it's, it's similar to somebody being ordained in a state of mortal sin. Right? So we hope this never happens, but it can happen. And that person is validly ordained. Only God knows whether they're in the state of grace or mortal sin. Um, and um, so they'll be validly ordained. Sacramental character, priestly character will be imprinted, but they won't be getting the sacramental graces that they need to sanctify their ministry and to grow in pastoral charity because of that obstacle. But as soon as that obstacle is taken away, that priestly character now will be the source of those graces. So the same thing in matrimony. Right? So all that the couple needs is a good confession on each part. Let's do the first part. So in the case of matrimony in a natural marriage, is there still an intermediate level of some sort? Yes, but not a sacrament, right? Because um, they're not, baptism is the, the gateway to all the other sacraments. So let's take my wife and myself. So Marsha and I were, were married as unbaptized persons. We exchanged a, a valid exchange of vows, consenting to what matrimony is. And so therefore, the matrimonial bond was formed, but not a sacramental matrimonial bond. Because the matrimonial bond is something natural that God created with creating Adam and Eve. Right? So in, in Eden already, Adam and Eve had that matrimonial bond. Right? And Jesus gives witness to that, saying, what God has joined together, let not men break asunder. Right? So in every marriage, that matrimonial bond is formed. But it's not a sacrament unless the spouses are baptized. So it, it's impossible to have that bond not be a sacrament in, in baptized people. But it's impossible to have that bond be a sacrament in unbaptized people. Sorry, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Right? In other words, for, baptized, for people who are baptized, there can only be a sacramental marriage. There's no option right, for baptized Christians to get an unsacramental marriage. It's either valid, in which case it's sacramental, or it's invalid, in which case it's nothing. But, and for unbaptized people, they can only have a valid one, I'm sorry, a natural one, and once they get baptized, both though have to be baptized for it to be a sacrament. And if only one is baptized, it won't yet be a sacramental marriage. Your final question in the middle there, what about grace? So that's a great question. So this here is theological speculation on my part, but I'll tell you my opinion on this. And yes, I think that there, so we're going to, in a later talk, we're going to look at the role of desire in anticipating graces. And so that 
is usually known under the subject of baptism of desire, but also recently in the pandemic, since we've been under lockdown and um, during Lent and Easter season, that brought um, spiritual communion into the forefront. Um, and that's a similar case of receiving grace of a sacrament, in this case, the Eucharist, by desire. So in the case of, let's take the case of baptism. Baptism by desire, that would be people who are unbaptized desiring the graces and God um, will, so he said, Jesus says, whoever asks will receive. Right? Whoever knocks, it will be opened unto them. So if we ask God for the, anyone who asks God for the grace of salvation, right? anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, St. Paul says. And so something similar, it seems, applies not only to baptism and the Eucharist, but also to the other sacraments except holy orders. So holy orders, you can't get holy orders by desire. And I think that's, there's an obvious reason for that. I teach at a seminary. If there could be holy orders by desire, the whole seminary would already be ordained. Um, but the fact is they're not um, because it's a public thing. And something similar is the case for the matrimonial bond. You can't get that by desire. You only get that by expressing the vows in public. Um, but what can happen is there can be a natural marriage. So let's take, again, Marcia and myself. So an unbaptized couple who's married with a natural marriage, the couple can desire sanctification of their marriage. And hopefully they do. In fact, that was a big part of our conversion story. In fact, in precisely my recognizing, I wasn't able to love my wife as she needed to be loved. And therefore that I needed grace. I didn't have that word. But I needed something. I needed the power to be able to love her better, I recognized. And that was really the decisive thing in, in my conversion story. And, and so that I would see as a desire for the graces of the sacrament of matrimony in somebody who doesn't yet have a sacramental marriage. So I think, yes, that can exist. And the key thing is to desire. Desire is so important in the spiritual life. Great question. Thank you. All right, another question from Jason. Um, in the Eucharist, it seems that the signification of the first level is a representation of something else. That is, it looks like human food. The sign signification of the second level nevertheless points towards the grace of the third level. Is the sign in the first level a parable in its own way? Yes, great question. So the sign, the outward sign of bread and wine is a double sign. So we looked at this, I don't know if you remember, about three lectures ago, and we said that the, um, Jesus chose bread and wine to be the matter of this sacrament for two, at least two reasons, probably three reasons. Um, one of them being that um, the most obvious reason is that they're food and drink. And so he wanted to, rep so that clearly represents the third level, which is because Jesus wants to nourish our supernatural life in a way analogous to how we nourish our natural life. Well, we nourish our natural life by food and drink. And so he's instituted the Eucharist to be the sacrament of spiritual nourishment, nourishing us with grace. So that's the meaning of the bread and the wine. Yeah. But it also, he chose bread to also have a similarity to his body. So the bread has a double similarity to, to body and to um, food. And the wine, a double similarity to drink in general, but also to blood, especially if it's red wine. Yeah. So that it could represent both um, aspects, this intermediate level and the level of grace. Great question. Question from Todd. Can you explain the distinction between licitness and validity using a couple of examples? Yeah, sorry, I went through that too fast. Great question. So um, let's take the Eucharist. Um, suppose the priest, um, let's say a Latin rite priest, uses leavened bread, that would be illicit because in the Latin rite, the bread has to be unleavened. And in the Eastern rite, the bread has to be leavened. So if an Eastern rite priest uses unleavened bread or a Latin rite priest uses leavened bread, in both cases, it would be illicit against canon law, against the rubrics for their respective rites. But in both cases, it would still be valid because it's still bread. Right, and in order, so the, the, to, for validity, what you need is the essential thing that Jesus established, and that is bread. 
and both leavened and unleavened bread are bread. So both are valid, but in each rite, only one is licit. That's how it would be an example. Another example would be, let's say in confession, you go to confession, and the priest says the words of absolution, I absolve you, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before that, instead of saying what the church prescribes, he invents a different formula. Sometimes that happens, right? A priest will say the essential words, but then instead of the other rubrics, he'll invent something. That's illicit, but it's still valid because he said the essential words. But let's say instead of the essential words, I absolve you from sins, he says something else entirely. It would be both illicit and invalid. Or in baptism, let's say um, instead of I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they say I baptize you in the name of the Creator, um, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. That would be both illicit and invalid because it wouldn't, it would, that's a, a kind of Trinitarian heresy there of modalism. Yeah. Yeah. So there's be some examples. Yeah. All right. So it's valid as long as the essential core is present. And whenever it's valid, that intermediate level will be produced. Okay. Um, but it can be illicit and still be valid. And that happens many times. Shouldn't, right? Priests ought to follow the rubrics, um, not just on the essential things, but on the other things too. Okay. Um, in regard to your, from April, in regard to your discussion on redemptive suffering, can you speak of the importance of offering up our sacrifice? How and why? Also in the mass, when the priest says, for my sacrifice and yours, great. Are we to offer up a special sacrifice intention then as well? Sure, but it doesn't have to be right at that moment. Um, it can be throughout the mass. In other words, we want to, what we should think when we go to mass is that we're sharing in what Christ is doing. And we're sharing by bringing to the altar our own sacrifices. And our own sacrifices is our Christian life. Right? In the hard things and in the more joyful things, all of it, to bring it together. And so we can think the offertory is probably the best time for this, but there's no one time. And we, whenever we think of it, we can do it. And outside the mass, we can also do it. And that would be a kind of spiritual offering. Um, but the offertory is kind of the, maybe the classical time to do it. So when we're, in, instead of just putting, all right, I put in my $10 or whatever it is, um, but what I really want to put in that basket is my life. That's what Jesus wants. He wants my heart in that basket. And so that's when we want to, we can think best about what we're offering and contributing to the mass. Now, that's not to say we ought not to support monetarily. We ought to do that also. But that's a sign of the deeper thing that we're giving to Jesus. And yes, it, um, and how and why. So the how, there's no, thanks, fortunately, there's no how really, because Jesus just looks at the heart. So the how is simply in the heart. What Jesus wants is our heart and our heart giving that. And so there's no one way to do it and it doesn't matter how we do it. The why is because he wants solidarity. He came not to substitute us, but to bring us into communion with him. And communion means that we share the same heart. And so if we're sharing Jesus' heart and he's offering himself on the cross in every mass, we have to be offering ourselves too and not holding back. And the best way to offer that is desire to, to tell, all right, I'm offering you my life, but I wish I could offer it better and desire it more. That's actually the best thing we can offer him is our desire to do it more. In other words, awareness of our own weakness is a great thing to offer him. That's no obstacle. See, that's what's so beautiful, is that's actually the best thing we can offer him, is awareness of our own weakness in offering. And last question from Thomas. I talked to you earlier about God's mercy at death. Could you explain it again for me? Um, so, God has given us this life as the chance to this, um, for this solidarity, right? In other words, God has given us a lifetime in which we are to conform ourselves to Christ, either simply by an unknowing desire in the case of people who don't know Christ or a knowing desire in the case of us who know Christ. And that's what our life is for, as it were, to be configured to Christ and joined into Christ and saved in Christ. And so he's given us our lifetime for that to happen. 
And so this whole life is the time of God's mercy. And of course, the after time is the time for him to um, uh, consummate that mercy by giving us a share of his glory. In other words, this life is the time of his mercy in which we can share in his cross. And then after this life is the time of his mercy in which we share in his resurrection and glory. Um, and so it's all mercy, but um, we need to work it out during this life. Um, and so the sacramental system is the means by which we are to um, be inserted into Christ's life and thus come to share in his divine life by sharing in his cross. Um, and so, um, yes, that's why we're given unlimited chances in this life, but death will put it to an end. And since we don't know that day, right, that's why we're not to put off our conversion. Right? No one knows the day and the hour. Um, and so, yes, there's an urgency to our salvation and to our working for it because we know that an end will come. So that's a good thing, knowing that the time of mercy right, lasts until death. In other words, that is the time in which I can change my fate by being inserted into Christ um, or more deeply inserted, um, but that it'll have an end and therefore I should hasten. And that's why we pray, say, in the rosary, um, the, in the Hail Mary, right? Pray for us now, but in a special way at the hour of our death, because how we are at the hour of death determines our eternal. And so John of the Cross has a famous line that we will, on, in our particular judgment, we will be judged by love, by the love with which we have at the time in which death finds us. That is the habitual charity um, that we express in, in concrete things, but nevertheless, that um, grows in us day by day, hopefully, and gets nourished by the Eucharist and the other sacrament, restored if necessary by penance. Okay, um, any other questions? I, I have a, um, a sort of a question or comment. Right? Um, you mentioned, you said something um, that uh, the, like the Eucharist nourishes our faith because it is, because we can't understand it. Huh. You know, because we, you know, we can't see it, although, so when, when the um, priest holds up, particularly I was doing this during, um, when I couldn't go to Mass, mm -hmm. he'd hold up the Eucharist and I'd say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so, but then I'm thinking, am I grasping for knowledge which, that I don't want to feel weak? Yeah, or just desire, yeah. if you know what I'm saying, and I'm sure, I, I want, maybe God wants me to feel weak and that I don't get it yet. I, so I just thought maybe you could comment on that. That Beautiful. That's a great, yeah. So that's a wonderful prayer. And um, I believe, help my unbelief, taken from the Gospels, right? So that's the, right. the man who, with the uh, son who was the um, epileptic. Um, I believe, but help my unbelief. And, and all of us are in that situation, right? There's no person in the church who doesn't find themselves um, wanting to believe more and more powerfully we do. And the, the reason for that is simple. It's because faith, hope, and charity are gifts that are unlimited. No matter how much faith we have, we could always have more faith, right? We could believe more firmly. And no matter how much we hope, we could hope more. And no ma matter how much we love, we can always love more. And so um, we should always pray for an increase of faith, hope, and charity. But it's beautiful in praying for that increase to also thank him at the same time for the gift that he's already given us, right? And so that's what that prayer does. I believe, and I thank you for that gift of faith, but help me to believe more. And a great time to exercise that is when Jesus is shown to us at the elevation, right? Because he's there precisely present, but invisible to our eyes of flesh, visible to our eyes of faith. And it's a great time to ask him to increase and nourish our faith, because that's one of the purposes of Eucharist, is to nourish faith as well as hope and charity and grace. What I don't want it to that. fall into is feeling discouraged because, mm -hmm. I, because I don't have the faith that I want. You know what I mean? Discouragement right. is like pride entering into it or grasping or something. And well, so, don't worry about it. It's just simply part of the Christian life 
that no matter where we are, Jesus wants us to be more, yeah. right? He's constantly, he's like super coach um, in which he's constantly raising the bar on us. And what that means is he's constantly giving us new trials because he wants us to grow far more than we want to grow. And so one of the ways he does this in the lives of the saints is actually giving them trials of faith. Okay. And so that's, that's what be the night, the dark night, yeah. say that St. Therese. So St. Therese of Lisieux, a great example. She enters the convent and she enters into this dark night of faith in which she no longer has the consolations. And so, yes, she's constantly making acts of faith in that state. And so she's exercising her faith more than ever and growing in it more than ever. But God, simply Christ, has raised the bar on her. Yeah. Mother Teresa, another great example. Sure. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a great prayer. Dr. Feingold. Uh-huh. Um, if someone receives uh, the Eucharist and doesn't believe it's truly uh Jesus is uh body blood soul and divinity how does that affect the person receiving it does it affect the i guess the fruitfulness and the graces that god would give sure so it, they in such a case let's say someone who doesn't believe in the real presence they they obviously will receive the real presence and jesus is present in them for some 10 minutes in his humanity um but in order for them to be nourished, that depends on their dispositions. And so if it's culpable disbelief, so now there are many people who don't believe because they were never catechized, in which case it might not be culpable. If that's the case, they can still be in a state of grace and still be receiving fruit from the Eucharist. But obviously Jesus doesn't want that. He wants them to be rightly catechized and to believe in it, in which case they'll receive more because they'll be cooperating more. They'll understand more what's happening. But it could also be the case that somebody is culpably disbelieving, but only God knows the difference there. In which case, um, so somebody receiving in a state of mortal sin won't be getting nourished, right? They'll be receiving Jesus' body and blood, just like everyone else, but it won't nourish their soul. And they would do better not to receive. But if they don't know, and they're not culpable for it, then, um, then they can still be nourished. But we ought to do better at catechizing so that doesn't happen. Um, Jason, you put up Mark 934. What is that? That's, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So on that note, it's in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God. But these know thy gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Shalom. So thank you all. And um, our next talk, David, is on what day? It's on uh, July 12th, the gifts of grace communicated by the sacraments. Right. So for the next, the next two talks are going to be about sacramental grace. So the one on July 12th will be about the gifts of grace in general. And then the one after that will be about the particular gifts of grace given by each sacrament. All right, so those are our next two talks. All right, so have a wonderful next oh, couple of weeks. Thank you. Shalom Aleichem. Thank shalom you. Aleichem. Aleichem shalom.